Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and current and former residents. If you missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays of Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box. And we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. If you have any questions after today's event, or if you're watching the recorded version and have questions or comments, please email me at jrm233 at pit.edu. This week, we're highlighting one of our extraordinary and very accomplished former University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery residents, Dr. Daniel Resnick. As for that, Dr. Freelander, thank you, and please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Justin, and it's nice uh, to be with uh, you all and to welcome uh, one of our esteemed alumni, Dr. Uh, Resnick. Uh, what I'd like to do, as I usually do, is say a few words about uh, COVID, which might be particularly important this time around, as well as then introduce our, uh, uh, our speaker. So since the last time that we were together a couple of weeks ago, things have changed uh, quite a bit again. Uh, you know, the Delta variant is uh, is out there and it's uh, I believe it's uh, dangerous. It's more contagious. But one thing that is uh, critical is what happens with people that are vaccinated uh, or not. Uh, Ninety seven percent of the uh, people being admitted uh, to the hospital, meaning that they're sick enough uh, to, to be admitted. Uh, are people who have not been uh, vaccinated. So again, I really urge uh, everybody listening uh, now and uh, later, if uh, you have not been uh, vaccinated, to carefully consider that. It's, uh, I believe, uh, 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 the right thing uh, uh, to do for yourself, for your family, as well as for the people around you. And in addition, the more people that are vaccinated, the less uh, reservoir for this virus is and the less of a chance it has to mutate and change and become uh, even worse. Uh, so again, people are concerned with all the potential uh, uh, side effects of uh, the vaccine. And I can tell you that there are no side effects. Obviously, there are some side effects as with everything, but it's uh, we weigh the risk uh, and benefits. It's uh, clear that the benefits of having a vaccine, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, strongly outweigh, and it's not even close, the consequences of uh, not being vaccinated, as I said, for yourself and your family and society uh, in general. If people have questions, uh, obviously always talk to your doctors. There are many resources uh, online to obtain uh, information. Uh, and then secondarily, as I always say, because we've seen people that have been harmed uh, by not coming to the hospital because of fear of uh, COVID, our hospitals are very, very safe. Uh, um, we're taking extreme uh, measures uh, for cleanliness. Uh, people are wearing masks, uh, and uh, uh, all the essentially all the healthcare workers are uh, vaccinated. So again, our hospitals are very safe. Um, we're also doing a significant amount of uh, telemedicine, so people can also be seen by their uh, physicians uh, virtu virtually from their home. Uh, I see many patients in their cars, and actually, I get very worried when they're driving. I tell them, please. To, uh, uh, pull over uh, during the telemedicine conference, but it uh, it really helps uh, people with their flow of their life to be able to do that. But again, more importantly, it's critical for people to be seen uh, if uh, if uh, you have symptoms, or at least call your primary care doctor or your specialist at, at any time. Um, going on to today's uh, presentation, it's really a pleasure and an honor to introduce uh, my good friend, Dr. Daniel uh, Resnick. I first uh, met uh, Dr. Resnick when we were both uh, in the interview trails uh, for, for neurosurgery um, many, many uh, years ago. This would have been uh, uh, in 1991 uh, or 1990 as we we're interviewing for to, to start in uh, 91. Uh, uh, we've known each other since. Uh, we've spent that uh, time together uh, in uh, meetings as well as in uh, organized uh, neurosurgery uh, leadership. Uh, Dr. Resnick uh, uh, went uh, and did his uh, residency here at the University of Pittsburgh and has been in Madison, uh, Wisconsin uh, uh, ever sin, uh, since uh, doing it incredibly well. One of uh, the thought leaders in neurosurgery, uh, former president of our Congress of uh, Neurological Surgeons and currently 
the secretary at the American Board of uh, Neurological Surgery. So uh, he's somebody who uh, is a, gives uh, of his time very uh, generously for others and for neurosurgery in general and particularly for his patients uh, as well. So I'm delighted uh, to uh, welcome him and uh, uh, Dan, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Robert. I was just doing some math during your um, uh, talk. I, I 32 years, my goodness. <laughs> it's, uh, I, my pleasure. Wow. Have fun. I, <laughs> That's, it's been a long time, I guess, uh, which I guess kind of ex explains why you're chairman and I'm secretary <laughs> of the AVNS type stuff, but uh, we've stuck around that long. But thank you very much for having me. It's um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to, uh, to, to, to speak with you this, this afternoon. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, American Board of Neurological Surgeons. When I was a resident and a um, and a junior attending, uh, I found the ABNS to be sort of a, a very intimidating black box. Um, I really didn't know how it worked. I just knew that that this group had tremendous power over my career, and that I had to follow the rules. And I just wanted to, um, you know, having, you know, been through the guest examiner route and being involved with the process now for well over well over 15, 20 years. Um, I just want to um, basically describe what the ABNS is, uh, what we do uh, at the ABNS, and um, maybe demystify the processes a, a little bit uh, in terms of what's going on. So I'm going to advance my slides. I understand there's a, a bit of a delay, uh, so I'm going to pause after advancing before I start talking. So the, the broad aim of the American Board of Neurological Surgery is to encourage the study, improve the practice, elevate the standards, and advance the science of neurological surgery, and therefore to serve the cause of public health. And our primary purpose uh, is to conduct examinations of candidates who voluntarily seek uh, certification and to issue certificates to those who meet the requirements of the board and satisfactorily complete its, its examinations. And this is a, a, a we take this uh, um, uh, job very, very seriously, and I want to describe some of the ways that we do this uh, going forward. Uh, currently, there are uh, just over 8,100 total diplomats certified by the ABNS since 1940. Um, that includes currently 5,678 5, active diplomats, so it's not a very large specialty. That's, that's, not a large, that's not a huge number of people. Of those active diplomats, not all of them are, are currently clinically active. Um, there are 2,500 time unlimited diplomats uh, still uh, alive who haven't, who haven't officially retired their certificates. And the renewable certificates uh, uh, are now uh, just over three, probably, at, probably over 3,200 at this point. Um, given our, our recent uh, uh, board examinations, and that includes 230 pediatric neurosurgeons. Um, so as you can see, the uh, renewable certificates now outnumber the time unlimited certificates. So the, the error of the grandfathered um, uh, uh, certificate is, is, is over. And currently there are about 660 neurosurgery residents and 116 ACGME training programs. So the, the major uh, functions of the ABNS include administration of the primary examination. So I'll talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about post case review, and I'm going to uh, speak specifically to the uh, residents and uh, young faculty members about the importance of this process. Uh, the oral examination, we'll talk a little bit about that. The continuous certification uh, process, which applies to all of us uh, who, have, who, who hold time limited certificates. And then the activities of the credential committee, uh, which is the committee which is, which is assigned the role of um, working with um, candidates who may have fallen out of the process, who may have had disciplinary actions um, uh, through uh, state um, activities, et cetera, um, uh, uh, getting, back on, getting back on track. So I'm going to start off with a written examination. Our last written examination was administered March 12th. And as those of you who are in the process know, we have gone uh, we had to make major changes in the administration of our uh, written examination due to COVID. Uh, we were not allowed to bring people into testing centers, uh, so we had to figure out a way to do this in a secure process where people could take the examination from home. Not only did it need to be a secure process, uh, but it needed to be uh, fair in that uh, people needed to be able to access the website um, reliably uh, get the examination done. And we also had to be able to verify that there wasn't, um, it wasn't an open book examination. It's not meant to be an open book examination. So the, we went through a number of machinations working with the National Board of Medical Examiners to make sure that we could get this, get this, get this done. And it turned out that in the last two administrations of the examination, there really have been no significant problems with the test platform. Uh, there was one resident who's a, a resident in Seattle who was doing a rotation in New Zealand 
who had the examination interrupted by an earthquake uh, and a power outage, but was able to log back on and finish the examination. I think that um, uh, from the ABNS standpoint, we don't really think there was much we could have done about this, but fortunately everything worked out well for that, for that candidate. In terms of the results of the examination, uh, these are the uh, results of the examination uh, in graphic format. The median uh, score was a uh, 552 with a standard deviation of 110. Uh, so the fail rate was uh, quite low at only 2.2% failing. Um, what this means is that if you scored 58% of the questions correctly, uh, you would pass the examination. There's been a significant movement within the board over the last 10 years, and this is finally coming to fruition uh, in this coming year. We don't feel that it is adequate for a candidate to pass an examination with only 58% of the questions right. Now, part of this is a function of the examination. The questions are very hard. Um, and uh, part of it is a, uh, a function of the nature of the examination, and that is an assessment um, examination as opposed to a mastery examination. As most of you know, the board has moved to making this a mastery examination with the expectation that candidates should score quite highly on this examination. And the way we're doing this is by releasing the question stems and the, well, we, we've already done it. Rele we have released the question stems and figures and references uh, for review by the candidates. And the idea is that by releasing these stems, this forms the curriculum of, of medical knowledge for neurosurgery. And, that, and we are expecting our candidates to, to know that body of knowledge quite well and, just, and to score quite highly on the examination. Uh, so this is going to be a, a big deal for us because all of a sudden we're going to have to redo how we score the examination. We're going to have to um, uh, really uh, uh, do a lot of work in terms of the psychometrics of the examination to make sure that the uh, questions are achieving uh, the goal of providing a mastery examination. Now, as we release these uh, questions, the site has been, our, the ABNS website has been accessed multiple times. As of May, remember these things were released in mid-March, uh, the, the site had been accessed 18, over 18,000 times. And uh, 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 candidates were looking at multiple questions in different, different categories, including the core competencies. Um, as you can see, the majority of folks accessing uh, the primary exam resource are the PG4s or the people who are basically taking the examination for credit. Usually uh, most programs, uh, residents will take the examination for practice, uh, PG3 year and take it for full credit, either, either PG4 or PG5 year. So you can see that that the PG4s are, are, the, are, the, are the folks who are driving uh, the website traffic and this is appropriate. Uh, overall, uh, this has been well received. Uh, in addition to releasing the questions we, uh, via the ABNS website, the ABNS has provided the question stems to the CNS, which is using the SANS mechanism to create a learning tool around uh, the, the question stems. And the uh, Senior Society is using those question stems to construct a curriculum to help guide residents through the, the study and data acquisition process. Uh, there have been some questions from end users, uh, some program directors have asked uh, why can we can we get uh, access to these um, uh, questions so that we can produce local learning tools? The answer is yes, you can, and that 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 has been done. Um, and uh, continue to ask us when we're releasing the answers because they they haven't kept up with their residents who already know that the, that the that the that the answers were released several months ago. Um, in addition, uh, the ABNS has piloted an anatomy examination. This examination is hosted on the uh, double is, is is based upon the uh, Roten Atlas, which is hosted on the AANS uh, website. And the idea was to create a early training experience or an early training master examination of basic uh, surgical neuroanatomy uh, that all uh, junior residents would pass to give them a, a, uh, a good basis uh, of anatomy to go forward with, with, go forward through the rest of the residency training. This is a pilot study at this point. Um, it is, th these are the results, so, so I'll just go back. Uh, so two residents got everything right uh, the first time they took it. About uh, 50 uh, after they took it the first time, got it on test B. 81, the majority scored 100 by test C, and some uh, needed the fourth uh, uh, version of the test to, uh, to get all the questions right. 
Um, it's actually a pretty hard examination. If you don't study for the examination, it's very, very difficult to, to do well. And you really need to study from the source material or else you won't be able to get these things, get, get the questions right. Because a lot of the, a lot of the um, uh, questions are very specific about the segment of a vessel or, or a, a um, relationship between two different nerves as they exit the skull base. So this, is, this again is a master examination. We're going to continue this for the foreseeable future. Uh, but it is not yet a requirement for uh, board certification. We are um, hoping to refine this examination so it has more surgically relevant anatomy as opposed to textbook anatomy. And we're also considering making several other mastery segments on um, uh, individual segments of neurosurgery, which are important for residents to uh, master early in the career, particularly critical care and potentially down the road radiosurgery or endovascular, which are still uh, su relative subspecialties within neurosurgery. Now I'm going to move on to the oral examination. Our last oral examination was administered this past May. Uh, as uh, most of you know, the oral examination oops, uh, now uh, consists of three parts. There's a general neurosurgery uh, portion of the examination. There is a subspecialty uh, um, portion of the examination. And then there's a candidate case presentation where the candidate's cases from their post submission are used uh, uh, to examine the candidate. Um, overall, the applicants uh, feel that the examination is, is a process is clear and transparent. Registration was clear and transparent. Um, many applicants, in fact, most applicants, at one point or another, reach out to the ABNS office for support. Um, and I would encourage those of you who are involved in the process and have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, it's our job to provide you the answers that you need so that you can successfully participate in the process. Uh, the changes from an in-person exam to a virtual examination were communicated clearly. I think it is quite obvious that the candidates very much prefer the virtual examination format. It saves a lot of money in terms of travel uh, time, airfare, hotel fees, uh, et cetera. And it um, allows the candidate to take the examination uh, in, a, in a comfortable area as opposed to at the uh, uh, examination center uh, in Phoenix. And the vast majority of folks felt that the examination was conducted professionally. The three folks who uh, felt that there was uh, some unprofessional uh, uh, behavior uh, were asked to provide more details and these were investigated. Um, in, all ca in, in each case, um, it turned into a bit of a he said, she said, and the senior examiner assigned to that session uh, did not feel that there was um, uh, any particular misbehavior. Uh, in all cases, the misbehavior was felt to be on the part of a guest examiner, uh, uh, but uh, the senior examiner did not feel that that that, that rose to the level of unprofessional uh, conduct. In terms of feedback from candidates, uh, the general questions were applicable to my practice. Uh, so, you know, 66, no, I'm sorry, 75% uh, thought that these were perfectly uh, applicable to, to my practice. If you are a functional subspecialist who doesn't take ER call, uh, may, maybe not, but uh, remember the purpose of this examination is to evaluate your ability to take, to function as a general neurosurgeon, uh, taking call, uh, working nights, uh, doing what we do. The focus que questions were applicable to my practice. Again, the vast majority, um, well over um, 80%, uh, felt that the uh, questions were applicable to their, to their practice. And remember, this is a this is a critical um, uh, group of candidates. These are the people who have just taken the examination, and uh, and may feel somewhat bruised uh, by by not knowing the answers to a particular question or such. And then the five cases reviewed during the oral examination accurately accurately reflected my practice. Now these are the candidates' own cases, so for them to for, for a candidate to claim that this doesn't reflect my practice doesn't make a lot of sense because these cases came from their practice. Now they may say, well, that was the one bad case I had. Well, you know, there were five, there were seven cases uh, selected, five of which were examined upon. So um, it shouldn't have been just the one bad case uh, from your practice. The fail rate this past uh, administration was approximately 15%, which is in line uh, with previous administrations. And this is actually a fairly high fail rate. This is a very high stakes examination uh, for the candidates. Uh, these are people who have jumped through every single hoop, gotten through top top in the class in medical school. I don't know why that's happening? Top in the class in medical school have completed residency, have passed the oral examination, have had their cases uh, uh, approved by 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 the board, uh, and uh, so this is actually a, quite a disappointment to many folks uh, when they fail the examination. If you fail the examination, you can retake it up to three times, but it has to be done within the 
um, seven years uh, following um, uh, following residency. If you get past that time point, then you are uh, facing a, a bit of a cliff in terms of uh, where your career is going to go uh, from that point. We are very careful to analyze the results of the oral examination to make sure that the examination is fair, that, uh, that there are not outliers regarding either particular questions or particular examiners. If you are a difficult examiner, um, that will be reflected in your scores and that will be corrected for in uh, the examiner, um, I'm sorry, the examinee results. So for example, if I happen to be a very difficult examiner, my average scores are lower than most of the other um, examiners, if I examine you and give you a relatively low score, that will be boosted in the final analysis to make sure that you are not being unfairly uh, judged by simply by the fact of having me as an examiner. Similarly, if I'm a very easy examiner and I'm giving everybody top scores, my your score, the, the score that you get from me will be lowered uh, by an amount so that, that you are not unnecessarily benefited by having me as, as an examiner. And the same with, with the individual questions. Most candidates who fail, fail on their own cases. Uh, and this has been something that has been fairly consistent from the incorporation of the cases into the examination. Uh, we, we use examiner case severity specific to the, to the candidate cases um, and look at how that relates to the overall performance on the examination. In general, uh, the range, the pass rate uh, in the case review session is actually more tight than uh, the um, uh, 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 pass fail rate for the overall examination. Uh, and by we have found uh, by, by studying these mathematically that by including the candidates' cases, um, the overall examiner reliability indices improved and there is greater measurement precision. So including these cases, while, th while, while they are the most problematic um, session for the candidates, actually improves the reliability and, uh, and accuracy of the examination. Um, now, in order to get the examination, you have to have your cases approved and you have to submit your cases through the POST process. So the POST is the Practice Outcomes of Surgical Therapies database, and candidates have been required to enter cases since March of 2018. And currently, candidates are required to enter 125 consecutive cases. Now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how this has just changed in the recent year. The number is still 125, but when and how you enter the cases has been modified slightly. Um, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. Using the POST database, we are able to assess uh, status and trends in diplomats in terms of the types of practice, and we can define candidates by practice setting, geographic location, subspecialty training, as well as their training background. Uh, so here is just a snapshot of um, a POST data looking at uh, um, complications in cranial surgery. And as you can see, we can sort of benchmark complication rates uh, based on certain procedures and use these eventually down the road to red flag candidates who may have abnormally high complication rates uh, or com compared to, compared to their compared to their to their, to their uh, contemporary peers um, this is going to be a very powerful tool we, we're still working out um, making this making the data as reliable as possible this is going to be an incredibly powerful tool for flagging those who might be operating a bit outside the box so not it's not just relying on on a director review of an individual case lab but there will be benchmarks that directors can use to judge candidates against to, uh, to, to, to raise uh, potential red flags. We can also potentially provide feedback to program directors. So I'm program director at the U University of Wisconsin, Robert's uh, chairman at, at the University of Pittsburgh. We, the board can provide feedback to program directors to show us how our residents are doing in terms of their complication and concern rates across the board compared to candidates who are trained in other programs. So for example, uh, the, say your program is very heavy into Chiari malformations and say the chairman of your program loves doing Chiari malformations on folks who have fairly minimally uh, abnormal MRI scans. And perhaps you go into practice and you're doing a lot of these Chiari malformation surgeries on patients who have fairly normal appearing MRI scans. And say a director through review notes this and you are penalized because it seems that you're doing way too many of these operations on what appear to be relatively normal MRI scans. That information can be examined and fed back to the program director and say, hey, guys are seem to be doing 
too many of these types of surgery compared to everybody else in the country. Perhaps you should have a look at this. Uh, and that, so there's some, some um, possibly for real-time educational feedback uh, to program directors to make changes to their educational program based upon the subsequent performance of their, of, of their residents. Now, uh, there have been, there's been a change to the bylaws regarding the um, post-procedure. And those of you who are residents or those of you who are early in, in practice uh, need to pay attention to this. As of May 2020, um, in order for a candidate to present him or herself as board eligible, so you're not yet board certified, but as board eligible, you have to register in the ABNS, with the ABNS and establish a post case log prior to completion of your residency or approved fellowship. Candidates must begin participation and continuous certification immediately upon completion of residency or approved fellowship. So if you're taking call, um, even if you're not board certified, we still want you fulfilling the um, criteria for continuous certification, which includes a uh, adaptive learning tool based specifically for folks who are taking emergency room call um, immediately after resident. You need to enter 10 cases into post within the first six months of completing your residency or, or approved fellowships. And this is this, this what the purpose of this is, is twofold. Uh, first off, is a quality control check in your case logging um, capacity. So one of the problems we've had with candidates who have pre presented their post, their post case logs is that the case logs have been ex have been very sloppy. When we get a sloppy case log, it's very difficult to evaluate the performance of the resident of, of the candidate because there's not enough information in the case logs to judge whether or not these cases were appropriate, whether they were done appropriately, and, and how the patient did. So if you enter your if, if if the first 10 case logs show that the candidate is not taking the appropriate care to prepare these cases, they'll get feedback on that so they know that no, you need to be a little more. You need to be better in terms of describing what you did on whom and when. Secondly, if it is clear that in the first six months, this, this candidate is an outlier in terms of their indications uh, or results of surgery, the board can flag that person and bring them in for a, a, a hearing uh, to figure out what's going on earlier in the career, as opposed to having to wait five or six years of poor behavior before we're able to root this out. Um, so. Two, th th those are the two, two uh, reasons why we made this change uh, in the bylaws. Um, in exchange for the candidate participating early and uh, submitting those 10 cases, only 115 additional cases are required and those 115 don't have to immediately follow the first 10. They can be entered on the normal timeline, the 10 cases, and then the 115 need to be consecutive with each other. But the first 10 cases, you can take a, a, a break if you want to. Uh, personally, um, my recommendation, once you're in the process of enrolling the cases, it probably makes us just, just to keep on going uh, so that you don't, so that you can uh, move through the process as quickly as possible. Continuous certification. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, recent graduates are going to need to participate in continuous certification and all ABNS diplomats with time limited certificates, which is going to be the vast majority in the next uh, few years, need to participate in this every year. And there are four parts. Uh, the first part is professionalism. Uh, professionalism require th this part one requires you to uh, sign a pledge uh, saying that you are going to uh, follow the ABNS code of ethics, which is which is um, uh, on the website. You read it, you sign it. You need to demonstrate that you have hospital standing, uh, state licensing, and, and appropriate privileges. Uh, to demonstrate that you are actually practicing as a neurosurgeon. Uh, we are not, uh, ABNS certification is for neurosurgeons. You, you need to demonstrate that you are actually practicing as a neurosurgeon. And there's going to be a chief of staff questionnaire, which also can be filled up by your chairman or perhaps even a senior partner if you, if you are at a, at a community hospital, attesting to the fact that you, uh, are, in, that you are practicing in good standing at your local, um, uh, local facility and have appropriate credentials. Two, a lifelong learning and self-assessment. The, the ABNS requires that you accrue at least 20 CME credits per year. Uh, in the pre-COVID days, this was quite easy. Uh, last year, when everything was canceled, it became a little bit more difficult, but it is, uh, it is easily obtainable. And in fact, part three, which is the assessment of knowledge, includes a 
the adaptive learning tool. If you take the adaptive learning tool and claim the appropriate credits from the adaptive learning tool, that can give you up to 13 hours of CME credit, uh, which can apply towards the, uh, the 20 hours here. So if you get that plus one meeting um, sponsored by the double NS or CNS, which automatically feeds back to the ABNS, and that lifelong learning and self-assessment part is taken care of. If your local hospital uh, gives CMEs for m and conferences or grand rounds, you can use those as well. Uh, you, you just need to submit those uh, uh, with, with a documentation uh, to the to the ABNS on the website. Part three, uh, assessment of knowledge. Uh, this is the adaptive learning tool that I've mentioned before. It is a, it is a a tool that consists of anywhere, I think it's about 60 questions at this point, based upon um, high-level evidence published in the neurosurgery literature in the, in the past five or six years. Every year, uh, new, uh, one or two new modules are added and one or two new modules are subtracted, but many modules, but, but, but it takes time for the modules to pass through. See, there is some repeat year to year on the modules, but for me, I'm a spine person. Uh, reading the um, up latest literature on endovascular versus open uh, treatment of, 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 of aneurysms, reading the latest uh, literature on the man endo endovascular management of stroke um, is, is very useful for me. Reading um, critical care, reading the critical care literature on uh, ICP monitoring in patients with head injury with the recent randomized controlled studies is very useful for me and it helps me when I'm taking call in the emergency room. Even though I'm a spine guy, I still see patients with head injury. I still take, patient, take, take care of patients uh, with uh, 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 brain tumors. And I still do microvascular decompression for uh, trigeminal neuralgia because when I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh, I had to promise to do that forever. And so I still do. Uh, and so I need to know uh, I need to stay current with, with, with the broad um, uh, base of knowledge in neurosurgery. Finally, part four is uh, m and participation. There has to be some sort of meaning part, meaningful participation in personal case review. If your department has a weekly m and like ours does, like the University of Pittsburgh does, to fulfill this, you just need to have your chief of staff or chairman simply uh, report that you have meaningfully, meaningfully participated in m and throughout the year. Um, if you are in private practice, if you don't have access to a specific neurosurgical m and there are two ways you can do it. Some folks will participate in, in their institutional m and which is probably not quite as useful, uh, talking about ob guide and general surgery uh, participations and your occasional complication. Um, or there are national m and um, uh, programs offered by the WNS, the CNS, the spine section, the vascular section, where you can you can present your own cases at these forums and get credit uh, for, for, for this part four. Um, on the website are details in terms of what exactly you need to do to submit this information and what exactly counts and what exactly doesn't count. So check check the uh, website, it's abns.org, and the information is, is there for you. Some recent initiatives uh, by the board in, in, include the following. We've, uh, after many years of a deliberation, have uh, figured out a way to uh, recognize outstanding foreign medical graduates who are, who are faculty in our training programs. Uh, this has been a, 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 an issue that has been discussed over and over again, particularly uh, regarding Canadian nurse surgeons from, from, from high quality um, uh, programs over the years. Now, I'll talk a little bit about this in the next slide. Uh, we've, been, we've developed a hearing process, which um, in the past was only used for neurosurgeons who had gotten into some licensing, licensing issue and were looking to uh, reinstate themselves as, as a, a diplomats uh, after the appropriate disciplinary uh, actions have been taken. With the advent of the post-case review, the hearing process has been used uh, more and more to um, evaluate candidates whose case logs raise significant concerns. The hearing process allows the board to give feedback uh, to the, uh, to the uh, candidates so that they perhaps can change their behavior in advance of sitting for the examination when it is felt that the candidate has a very high likelihood of failing the examination if changes to their practice patterns aren't made. And finally, there's been a, a significant work over the last five to seven years uh, in terms of recognition of focused practice cert certifications in endovascular neurosurgery, pediatric neurosurgery, and neurosurgical critical care. So this is the uh, this is the um, uh, ABNS certification pathway for exceptional foreign medical grads, uh, and this is specifically designed for those foreign medical grads who are actively involved in training neurosurgery residents 
or fellow ACG me residency or fellowship or, or, or ACG AC improved fellowship or cast that ACG me approved residencies or cast approved fellowship programs. Um, this is a pilot program. We've not made permanent changes to our to our to our um, uh, bylaws. But in general, these are for the folks who are training folks who are going to be ABNS uh, certificate holders. Uh, the highlights in general, uh, these these uh, folks need to have five years of academic service in a training program as faculty. They must have a high level of academic achievement. They have to pass a written examination. They have to pass, submit a post case log and they have to sit for the oral examination. So it's not an easy pathway, but a pathway now does exist. So those of you who are listening, who are uh, chairman or program directors or faculty at other programs uh, who know folks who fit these criteria, I would encourage you to uh, let them know that these these opportunity that this opportunity exists. This is the statement on fellowships by the ABNS. I put this up because it seems every month there's yet another question about what qualifies as a fellowship and what does not uh, qualify as a fellowship. With the exception of uh, the um, critical care experience, which has to be done um, after PGY3, but can be done before PGY7, or the angiography, angiography portion of the endovascular um, cast fellowship, all fellowships, be they enfolded or postgraduate, have to occur after the performance of the chief year. So this has to be PG7 in training programs that allow chiefs, to, that allow residents to do their chief year in PGY6. Um, this has changed over the years, which is why there's been so many questions about this, but this has been uh, pretty much the um, policy since 19, 2019 and is effective July 2021. Um, so that concludes my um, uh, my uh, presentation. At this point, I'd be happy to take uh, questions on really any topic related to the ABNS. Uh, we I, we talked about the written examination, post continuous certification, uh, the uh, hearings, and the primary certification process, and and the uh, a recognition of folk and pra recognition of folk and practice process. Um, I'll conclude my presentation here, and I'll I'll uh, stay on the line for any potential questions regarding what we just talked about. Thank you very much, Dr. Resnick. Uh, what a really uh, incredible and formative presentation. Uh, we're going to begin the Q&A portion of our presentation. Uh, we'll try to get to as many questions in our allotted time. Dr. Freelander, would you like to uh, start us off? Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dan, for a, a really terrific uh, presentation. Provides a nice uh, sense of what uh, the role of uh, the ABNS is and in particular the changes over the years to try to improve uh, the uh, you know the role and the and the function of the ABNS. Um, wanted to ask was we we have some uh, lay public uh, which uh, listens uh, to these uh, uh, lectures and I have a question for you. Both the initial oral exam as well as the maintenance of certification. What do you think it does? The ABNS does and does not do in terms of a uh, you know oversight and making sure that the that the neurosurgeons that are they're out there are are safe uh, i know that, that that's a that's a huge uh, uh role of what the abns is but I, i'd be curious uh, to hear your opinion on both what do you think it accomplishes and what do you think it does not oh i, I actually bob that's a perfect question i mean obviously there's you know the peacock series dr death you know uh, uh, uh out there right now so it's it's, it's a hot topic um, you know, the, the purpose of the post case log review is to so that the board directors can actually see what the candidate is doing uh, in, in real time. If they're, if they're consecutive cases, they're audited uh, to make sure they're consecutive cases. If there's a discrepancy uh, noted between the institution reported case logs and the candidate reported case logs, that's investigated. Uh, so we see what their cases are um, and we take predominantly indications very, very, very seriously. Um, so we all understand that complications happen, uh, but uh, if, if complications happen when you're doing the right thing, we understand that. If complications are occurring because you're doing questionable things or if you're getting away with questionable indications, that's likely going to spark, spark a hearing or result in failure of the examination. So in order to pass the examination, you have um, passed the written examination. Your, your case logs have been re reviewed by senior neurosurgeons who are experts in the field and approved. 
And then you've passed the oral examination where those cases are examined by another set of senior neurosurgeons. The move to the early registration of post uh, was made in recognition of the fact that a resident could finish their program and would not, and what could in the past could essentially be invisible to the double NS for a period of up to five years, I'm sorry, to the ABNS for a period of up to five years uh, until they, they start to time out because of not participating in the uh, certification process. Um, that is not really acceptable, uh, we thought. So we've changed the processes so that the um, candidates have to, we need to know about them before they finish the residency and they need to begin this case logging process within the first few months of practice. Now, this is a hardship for some folks. If you're in, if you're in the military, for example, or as we know, uh, you know, Bob, um, you know, many neurosurgeons change their practice in the first two years. Um, you know, we, I, I, we, we see candidates who've been through four jobs, you know, before they come to the certification process and they have great difficulty in collecting their cases and such. If someone's been through four jobs, that, that's a bit of a red flag in and of itself. Um, but sometimes it's not their fault. Sometimes, you know, family situations, illness, you know, whatever, whatever causes that. So um, it's, uh, it, it gives us a way to begin tracking folks earlier and by having them participate in the continuous certification, we're at least making sure that they're getting fed the cognitive uh, information they need to practice across the breadth of neurosurgery in an, in an urgent or emergent fashion. Did that go somewhat towards your question? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and it's amazing what the uh, ABNS is able to accomplish uh, uh, with that. I, you know, I was, uh, I've been fortunate uh, to be a guest examiner on a number of occasions, and it's impressive, you know, the, the care and judgment that, uh, you know, brilliant people within our subspecialty put towards uh, this effort because it's, it's so important for, for the specialty and obviously for our patients and for society that uh, we keep the appropriate amount of uh, oversight and how to do that is, is always a, a question, and, and it's nice to see how it is, it is evolving. I was a uh, a uh, guest examiner, one of the first times that uh, people had uh, their own cases uh, being evaluated. And at first, uh, you know, there's change and you're not quite sure how it's going to uh, turn out. And I was uh, incredibly impressed as one of the comments that you made that uh, one of the main reasons that people fail is from uh, their own cases and discussion of their own cases as well as presentation of uh, their own cases. So I thought that that was a brilliant um, transition, which really picks out what one of the goals is, is to pick out people that we think are unsafe or people that need uh, different supervision or, or different uh, um, uh, components. Uh, you know, it's right now only one section is is the one that it's uh, your own cases. Um, do you see that ever expanding to be more of the exam? Because I, it really seems like it's more sensitive and picking up uh, problems. Well, it is, and you know, the, goal, the, goal, the goal of this process is to, for anyone who, who, who looks at the process, be they a neurosurgeon, be they a hospital administrator, be they a, a member of the, of, of a concerned member of the public, to look at this process and say, hey, you know, this makes sense. You know, um, you know it, it, we want to be transparent, we want to be equitable, we want to be fair, but it needs to be rigorous. You know, so that, that's why, that's one of the reasons why we, we, we've included the, the case reviews. We feel that currently we feel it's important to have the general and subspecialty sections in there because if your whole practice is, as I mentioned before, you know, deep brain stimulation in a, in a boutique practice in Southern California, well, that's great, but you're licensed to do neurosurgery. And neurosurgery is more than just deep brain stimulation in a boutique practice in Southern California. You know, uh, we are licensing you or certifying you to take call at trauma centers, to take call at stroke centers, uh, to be part of the, to, to, to be to be part of a spine center, right? So we need to make sure that you have a knowledge base that is adequate for the basic level neurosurgical care of patients from across the breadth of neurosurgery. So that's why we feel it's important to have the the the, the general session uh, of there. The subspecialty session is to acknowledge the fact that you know I've not taken care of it. I've not put the aneurysm since. 2007, and I hope that I never ever will again. Uh, you know, I, I've I've not I've not taken out an acoustic neuroma since 2005, and I hope I never ever will again because now I have partners who like to do that stuff, um, who don't necessarily like to do what I do in terms of, of spinal surgery. So, um, 
if I were to take the examination, I would probably do fairly poorly if I was being specifically quizzed on uh, issues related to microsurgical anatomy of ACOM aneurysms or targets for um, DBS electrode placement for various uh, um, uh, uh, syndromes. Um, but I think it'd be very fair to ask me very hard questions about spine, because that's what I do 80% of the time. Um, and so, so we've incorporated that. And candidates can choose what they want to do. They can either do pure general, you know, general and two general examinations, or they can do general plus a, a, a focus, focus examination. Um, I would say that it, it does appear that there's been some gamesmanship uh, from the candidates. Apparently, there was a rumor that the spine, um, the spine, the spine examination had a lot of peripheral nerve stuff in it, so everyone switched to general, and it, it, it really doesn't matter. I, I would encourage candidates to, to take a look at their practice and choose the choose the pathway that, that's appropriate for them. Uh, trying to game the system is probably not going to work. Um, I will tell you that. Um, Having had feedback from multiple uh, candidates, the general session reflects things that you would expect to see during a night on call at your average uh, level one trauma center. Um, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's the stuff that comes in all the time. You know, the, the Coumadin bleeds, the head trauma, the, the you know, the, 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 the seizure with the, with the new onset tumor or something like that. It's, it, it's the stuff that we see all the time. So don't, be, don't be afraid, just be prepared. Um, my, my advice is, is, is learn the format of the examination uh, and then just do what you would do in real life and you'll probably be fine. Yeah. So one, uh, one final question for me, and this is, uh, you know, pertains to the, the virtual um, um, aspect of, uh, of uh, the testing that, that we had to do last year. You know, so much of society right now is trying to figure out uh, what part of a, the virtual life that we've had uh, the past year should stay and what should... Uh, uh, go, um, you know, just before uh, the interview started, uh, we were you and I were talking about uh, you know the interview process for residency, and which was virtual last year, and uh, looks like uh, most of it's going to be uh, modified virtual uh, this year. But uh, you know, for a resident, the interview uh, clearly being uh, being uh, having f uh, feet on the ground and looking at a at a program and seeing the facilities and all that. Uh, makes a difference, but uh, you know, obviously I understand the reason why these are going to be uh, virtual. The the, uh, the oral exam seems like there's very little gain by being in person. Um, what are your thoughts? Is this something you think is going to stick or what is uh, the board uh, um, thinking at this point? Yeah, I agree and the board agrees 100% and the candidates have given us uh, significant feedback to that effect as well. So, um, I mean, it saves so much money, time, um, you know, I mean, the whole examination takes, you know, it's three 40 minute sessions over three hours. So instead of having to fly out someplace for three days for a three hour, you know, examination, you, you do it in your in your house or in your office. Um, so it's, it's much better. And it's also easier on the examiners. Uh, what we've lost, though, is the ability of the examiners to get together and discuss these things, um, discuss issues on a face to face basis. So there will be over the next year, um, what are going to be called educational retreats for the board examiners, people like yourself, um, the directors, um, upcoming folks who we want to get involved in the board's process to get together and, and to discuss um, issues related to the examination, related to the um, interpretation of the post case law uh, data, uh, related to interpretation of um, uh, the examination data, so that um, the next generation of the next generation of directors uh, have the opportunity to, to benefit from the experience of, of I guess now we're the old people um, <laughs> you know, uh, going through, but but and, and also for the um, uh, social aspects of it, you know, for a uh, for a first time examiner to be hanging out with, you know, chairman like you and 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 ex directors and past directors is, is really a, a a great opportunity for the the wisdom and lore of neurosurgery, institutional neurosurgery we passed on, and we, we've lost that the last year or so. So we're hoping that these educational sessions can, can um, help restore some of that. But the examination is likely going to stay virtual just for the reasons, the exact reasons that you, that you mentioned. Yeah, that's uh, that's great to hear. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Dan. Um, Justin, do you have any questions for Dr. Resnick? I do, yeah, we have, we have a number of them, so we'll get to a, a couple of them here. Um, Dr. Resnick, the first question for you. What would you recommend for current residents and uh, doctors in preparing for the exam? 
Well, as I mentioned before, um, the, you need to prepare for the examination. Uh, one, one very preventable uh, way that people screw up is they just freeze uh, when, when, when the examination starts because you're, you're, you're going to be really nervous. So the preparatory courses, having a senior partner or a faculty member um, run you through your cases, uh, run you, th you're going to know your cases in advance. So you, it's, it's fine to bring them to a, a faculty member or, or, a, or a friend to review those cases and try to try to anticipate what the what the directors are going to be asking you. Um, getting used to the examination format. The examination is not a teaching event. It's an evaluative event. So the, the examiners are going to be stone faced. They're not going to necessarily be mean to you, but they're not going to be nice to you either. It's, a, it's supposed to be a, a, a evaluative event. So don't look for people teaching you on this examination. And that can be very unnerving. I know it was very unnerving when I took the examination uh, back when the world was uh, lit by fire. Uh, but the um, the uh, but prepare for the format uh, and prepare to be nervous um, uh, for this and try to try to anticipate the types of questions that will be asked about your own cases. Those would be the that that would be the advice that I would give. Excellent, thank you. Uh, have you ever seen or experienced favoritism by the examiner, and if so, what is done? Well, so there were three complaints, and it, 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 the complaints weren't necessarily favoritism. The complaints were um, that the, a candidate thought that an examiner was either unduly harsh or was misleading uh, dur during the questioning. Um, and from an examiner, from an examinee standpoint, you know. He, I, I vividly remember sitting, I was I was evaluated by uh, Art Day, who gave me a question that was absolutely absurd. And I, you know, had I failed the examination, I would be very upset about that. Um, it turns out that that the examiners had already decided that I'd passed and he was just pulling my chain um, uh, uh, to, 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 to some extent. But uh, those were investigated and the senior um, reviewer was, was, was queried and the, and, the, and, the, and the questions were reviewed. And as it turned out that where those complaints were made, those examiners didn't, the examiners didn't fail those sessions. They thought they had failed, but they hadn't. Um, so um, some examiners are tougher than others. Some examiners appear to be tougher than others, um, but the board really bends over backwards to make sure that the examination is as uh, equitable and transparent as possible. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Resnick. Um, how has the individual case minimums impact a candidate's ability to become board certified by the ABNS? Well, you have to submit 100, 125 cases, 115 of them have to be consecutive. Um, so it turns out, this, and I did not know this, that if you, are, if you decide that you're gonna be a solo practitioner in Southern California, it's gonna take you a long time to get 125 cases. Um, if you are a hospital employee in Mayotte, North Dakota, you'll get those cases in three months. So there's a great variation in terms of how long it takes candidates to to, to accrue accrue these cases based upon their, their practice environments. Um, I think it is. I think I think the requirement has greatly increased the ability of the ABNS to judge safety and quality in candidates prior to certification uh, in a way that we did not, simply did not have before this um, database existed. So I think it has improved things substantially. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Resnick. Um, and you, uh, a couple of questions here about your residency at, at the University of Pittsburgh. I, you're a 1999 uh, graduate of, of the program, correct? Is it 98. 98. 98, I'm sorry. 90, 98. Um, I'm even older than I look. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so what, what are some of the most significant changes in neurosurgery training since your time as a resident? Well, we have to be nice to our residents now. You know, <laughs> you know, work hour restrictions are new. Um, uh, you know, all the uh, training on, um, uh, you know, equity and uh, training on uh, diversity and training on, um, you know, all, all this, all this has happened. I mean, you know, it's, it's almost embarrassing how, how old I am. You know, Bob mentioned that we, we've been we've been in this business for 32 years. Uh, you know, uh, uh, going forward, so a lot has changed in 30 years. The stuff we do, even in spying, we didn't have computer-aided navigation. We didn't have half the instrumentation we have now. We didn't have half the controversies we have now. When I was a resident, we didn't operate on back pain, you know, period, you know, uh, which I think was a lot simpler. But, um, you know, things have changed a lot in terms of the technology. Things have turned, changed a lot in terms of the, how residents are trained. Uh, things have changed a lot in terms of how, how, how training is evaluated by the RRC and the board. 
So it, it is a much more, I think it's a much better process now. I think it's much more transparent. There are anxieties that are now that didn't exist. When I was a resident, there was, there was really very little doubt um, back in the day that you weren't going to get enough cases um, because you were there all the time and you did all the cases. Uh, uh, these days, with the work hour restrictions and 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 uh, and such, residents get a little bit more nervous about that. Even though that 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 nervousness is probably unfounded, but overall, I think the process has improved substantially since when I was when I was a resident. Although I would not trade my experience for anything. Excellent, thank you. I think that's a nice segue to uh, our last question. Here we have time for one more question. What makes you proud about the uh, being a, a part of the Pitt UPMC residency program? Oh, I'm, I'm tremendously proud of uh, being a product of Pittsburgh. My my uh, faculty were outstanding, and my, the residents who I trained with are, are all are all all stars. I mean, you, you know, this past year at the board, we had one, two, three, four Pittsburgh products out of twelve directors. You know, that's a lot. Um, I don't think there's any other program that 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 could that could, that, could, that comes close in terms of the the impact that Pittsburgh Pittsburgh currently has uh, in the leadership of uh, of national neurosurgery. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, and thank you again for being here with us today. An incredible presentation. Thank you to our attendees. If you have any questions or would like to learn more ways about to, uh, supporting the department, please reach out to me at jrm233 at pitt.edu. We're so happy to stay connected with all of our former trainees and our, our uh, patients and friends of the department. Uh, Dr. Freelander, would you like to close us out for the day, please? Uh, sure. Well, thanks uh, again, Dan. It's been uh, nice uh, to uh, see you virtually. I think it's been maybe even a couple of years since uh, we've uh, seen each other uh, in person. Hopefully uh, soon we'll get back to uh, enjoying uh, our, our presence uh, uh, together. For uh, next week, uh, we're going to have Dr. Natalie Sherry uh, join us. She's our new neuropsychologist in our, in our department. Uh, to me, having a neuropsychologist is very, very important because it provides us a more in-depth uh, evaluation of the outcome of uh, our interventions. Uh, neurosurgeons are uh, maybe famous for doing very quick neurological exams and cursory exams. Uh, shouldn't say this in front of the secretary of, uh, of the board, um, but the, the question is how accurate they are. A neuropsychologist is able to really much more uh, carefully uh, and accurately evaluate the cognitive abilities of our patients and then we can really see the consequences of um, some of the things uh, that uh, that we do so to me it was very important to have a, a neuropsychologist within the department i hired uh, one dr luke henry a number of years ago uh, he's become so busy that we needed a second one so again we have uh, hired Dr. Sherry as a second uh, uh, person and uh, again uh, she'll be talking uh, next week so thank you all very much uh, stay safe uh, get vaccinated uh, if you're not and we'll see you next week thank you very much Dr. Resnick bye-bye take care Robert see you